Once again, uh, welcome everyone, wherever you are in the world, and I know many of you are uh, across the world um, with us. Uh, this is to the third of our series of the IOSH Fire Risk Management Lunchtime Back to Basics webinars. The previous sessions, as you know, have covered understanding the science of fire and the prevention of fire. So today we now move on to the subject of fire precautions. If you missed either of the earlier sessions, then you can watch recordings of these, which are available on our YouTube channel. So for those of you who are new to the sessions, my name is Neil Vincer, and I'm the chair of the IOSH Fire Risk Management Group. And it is once again, my absolute pleasure to introduce Michelle Pitkin, uh, my vice chair, Ian Scott, who is a committee member who will be joining us later on, particularly actually for the question and answer session. Ian, see who, where he is. Okay, I'm sure Ian will join us in a minute. And finally, actually, I'd like you to introduce you to Alan Shaw, who is another committee member, and he will be leading the webinar today. So, as a reminder to you all, Many of the webinars that we've seen over the past 18 months have centered on subjects that are of interest to the more experienced occupational safety and health or fire professional. However, many of the comments or questions that we've received have come from the less experienced practitioners, either the younger members or those who are just starting out in the OSH role or others that may have transitioned from another role into OSH. This series of webinars are therefore primarily aimed at those who are less experienced in the field, but we hope that they will also act as a reminder to those that have been in the role for much longer. Clear feedback from the previous sessions has clearly indicated that this is the case and there's been interest for everyone. So if you have any questions or need any clarification of any of the points mentioned, then please put those questions to us. We will try to answer as many as we can during this webinar, but experience has shown that there will be a significant number and time is unfortunately limited for us. So if we don't answer your question during this session, then we will release a question and answer document within the next few weeks, in which we will ensure that as many questions as possible have been answered. So watch out for details of the links uh, and we'll do it either through at these systems and indeed if you watch out um, through LinkedIn, uh, Michelle and the communications team will make sure you can pick up that data and that information. So let's move on to our presenter for the day, Alan Shaw. Alan is, as I said earlier, a member of the Fire Risk Management Group Committee and he's also a member of the IFE Northeast Branch Council. Um, he's currently a senior consultant working for Practical Solutions, a company for which he acts as a subject expert in disease and fire safety, and includes in this, obviously, the carrying out of fire risk assessments. In this role, he's worked with a number of prestigious clients in some diverse industry sectors, such as utilities, water, etc., Aviation, certainly he spent a lot of time in, and incredibly, even the space area. Uh, and I'm sure actually that, as Alan tells me, that fire risk assessment for fueling a Soyuz, Soyuz 3 rocket was a generally interesting project to work on, to say the least. So, as you can see, Alan has a vast experience from which we're going to pull on today uh, in his presentation. He's also prepared manuals, project management, and fire-related training, and has recently completed a Hotworks Permit to Work classroom training module um, for one of his clients. Previously, Alan also worked as a consultant for Bureau Veritas and Citation PLC, and for a short while acted as an aircraft dispatcher at Birmingham um, Airport. So you can see he has a wide range of knowledge. And I'm sure that Alan today will bring some of that experience to him and to the presentation as we move on. So, 
That's a little bit of background about where we're coming from and who's going to talk today. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Alan, who will now take us through the presentation. Thank you very much, Neil. So a basic guide to fire safety part three. Next slide, please. So this slide depicts, uh, depicts the fire safety wall board and it describes the fire triangle, how to stop a fire, types of fire extinguishers, duty of care and fire risk assessment and safe control measures. The wall board also reminds us about the basic types of fire extinguishers that are available, but remember that there are other fire extinguishers to be found, but more of those later. Next slide. So the fire triangle. Now the secret, as you probably already know from our previous um, seminar is to break the triangle by removing either one or ideally two of the sources shown. So remove the fuel, sources of heat or ignition, or remove the source of oxygen by smothering the fire or covering it with water, for instance. And as we saw in the previous webinar on science and chemistry of fire, we can also break the fire triangle by disrupting chemically the fire process. Next slide. So what does a combination lock have to do with fire precautions? Well, the key word here is security, or more accurately, safety and security. We need security and the assurance that we've identified fire safety hazards and risks and who may be harmed, and that we ensure that adequate fire prevention measures are in place. Now, in case of an unexpected or an exceptional event occurs and a fire actually breaks out. Key issues in fire prevention are stopping the fire from starting in the first place. Sounds obvious. Limit fuels that can burn by good stock control and by waste management. Limit sources of ignition. Limit the fire and smoke spread with passive fire protection and inspect the workplace frequently. Fire precautions compromise the ability to detect a fire and then raise an alarm by a manual call point, by a bell, a klaxon, shouting fire, and the ability to promptly respond to a fire alarm by positive, informed, and good human behavior, and by frequent fire drills and training. A means of escape is required, which is well lit, is kept clear of obstruction, and leads to a place of ultimate safety, clearly signposted at a fire assembly point or points if it's a large site, identified by signage, and shown on a site plan by the sign-in book at reception. Next slide, please. Precaution follows prevention. My colleague, Anne Isaac, spoke to you last month on fire prevention. Prevention stops fires from starting in the first place. Fire precautions manage the risk and the key roles of fire protection in the event of a fire are to provide routes of escape from the building that are protected from fire and smoke, and to create compartmentation within the building with compartments that themselves are protected from fire and smoke, and to prevent any smoke from spreading throughout a building during the evacuation and whilst suspicious put my teeth in, suppression occurs. Uh, to protect the building from a fire and to protect the people as they evacuate the building and to protect property. In my job, I'm more focused on life safety, but ad adequate asset protection is also an intention 
of fire prevention. Fires are controlled by an adequate fire safety plan and a fire safety management system, and more importantly, by a fire risk assessment by a competent person. And in this presentation, we shall consider fire and smoke detection and alarms, fire action notices, fire suppression, fire extinguishers, hose reels and sprinklers, fire classification, deployment of fire extinguishers, and stopping fire spread with passive fire protection and fire doors. Next slide, please. Okay, so next slide from there, please. Now this is bright red and shiny, so it gets our attention. What is it? It's a pumped water sprinkler system, uh, a means of detecting ignition and development of a fire with automated fire detection, AFD, is necessary. A means of raising the alarm, a smoke, fire or carbon monoxide detector and alarm plus a complementary and instantaneous means of warning people of a fire by a fire alarm sounder, and a mandatory and completed fire action notice with information to people on action to be taken by them and by others in the event of a fire. What to do, where to go, where to assemble safely, who is in charge, how to contact them, how to seek first aid if required, and how to report to the person in charge. Next slide, please. Okay. I meant to talk a little bit more about the sprinkler system, so I'll carry on and we'll leave that slide, please, where it is, because I'll come back to that. It's quite an interesting one. And while I'm talking, I want you to spot the detector, if you haven't already. So in the sprinkler system, fire safety notices are a mandatory requirement if you didn't already know. An automated means of fighting the fire if this is appropriate, and that may include sprinkler systems, it may not. Provision of manual fire fighting equipment if this is appropriate, with fire extinguishers, hose reels, fire blankets, etc. More of that later. Safe means of escape leading to an unhindered place of safety, which I mentioned, and the provision of at least one and preferably two or more fire escape routes, which are protected and lead to safety within a specified maximum distance where people are sleeping, studying, living or at work. And this protected route should lead to a place outside of the building or alternatively in evacuation within a building such as a, at an airport or a shopping mall. Going outside a building isn't always the safest option, it's particularly in London or other major cities of the world where there are traffic and narrow pavements. And provision of an adequate escape lighting and a safe means of escape with prescribed wayfinding, direction, pointers and signage and fire safety notices. Now, have you all spotted the smoke detector? It's right there in the middle of the architrave. Thank you for pointing that out. Smoke detection is one of the fundamental steps that can be taken in establishing fire precautions and steps to be taken if a fire breaks out. Normally, I say normally, not always, the detector is located in the center of a ceiling or of a room area or thereabouts, not so here. Regulations and guidance have changed since Grenfell and the provision of smoke detectors and alarms are covered by new legislation. So it's best to check on current situation with your fire safety advisor. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk uh, for the next one, two, three slides about the types of fire detectors and alarms. The first one, the most commonly used one, I would say, is an ionization device. 
as you can see, it's very sensitive. And the choice of design of a fire smoke or carbon monoxide detector is underpinned by the fire risk assessment. You'll be hearing me saying that quite a lot. This type of uh, detector is used in most domestic environments. Alarms can be battery or mains powered, and the detectors can be interlinked. New slide, please. Now, optical detectors, smoke alarms in this case, are to be determined by the fire risk assessment. And this type is useful in an industrial setting, but be careful because they are vulnerable to dusty atmospheres. And also beware that because of that vulnerability, that very often where there is maintenance work or where there is uh, painting or decorating or refurbishment, then these are often covered by plastic. And the person who does that often might forget to uncover them. So regular inspections will discover any of those errors. Next slide, please. Heat sensors and alarms, again, as specified in the fire risk assessment. I think a lot of my colleagues are too uh, sensitive to the fact that uh, a, a detector is in place and that it is more difficult to recommend an alternative or to question the actual detector in the first place. But a thorough, suitable and sufficient fire risk assessment will look at that and will make appropriate recommendations. And heat is very important, especially in a kitchen area, to avoid false alarms. To be used in conjunction with ionizing detectors now, I don't know whether you can see it. Uh, I haven't got control of the pointer, but the it looks like a metal, black metal spike coming down in the middle of that cage. Thank you very much. And that's a good way of discovering that it's a heat detector. Next slide, please. Well, now we're getting more sophisticated and this first alert example gives us a combined optical smoke and heat alarm. It's an excellent initiative to install this with a carbon monoxide detector in the same unit, particularly where there's sleeping accommodation. And that could be during the daytime for shift workers. So we have to think of the use of the building uh, at the same time, whether it's for work or for domestic use. The fire risk assessment will take care of that. And this sort of detector is very useful where living flame devices are used and also in small rooms. Next slide. Fire action notices, blank fire action notices. How often is this seen? Too often in my experience. Report to the assembly point, where? What to do when you think there's a fire? What? Useless. You must do as it says on the notice. And if not, then behavior falls into the field of complacency. And the ultimate complacency is not filling it in or filling it in, but without a, a, a permanent pen, which detail gets rubbed off, either deliberately or accidentally. Next slide, please. Fire action notices. Can you see the means of escape from this room, from the final exit, down the stairs, from the mezzanine and out again? You must do what it says on the notice. You must get out as quickly as you can. Do not, repeat, do not stop to collect any belongings. That is hugely important. And so often people will stagger out of the building, final exit with stuff that they bought for lunchtime and have kept in the office fridge. It's not risk worth risking your life for a sandwich, folks. Or they're trying to take away a coffee and trying not to spill it. Next slide, please. 
Incidentally, we were going to test the alarm on that slide, but happily we're not going to do that now, but we can answer questions on uh, alarm volumes in the Q&A session. In this instance, we've got a hose reel. Personally, I don't love them. Uh, personally, I believe they can only be used successfully by a trained fire brigade officer <coughs> or somebody who's had a lot of training and knows what they're doing. Too often I see them next to a 415 electrical panel, and that's stupid. And very often they will run through a door and be a breach of compartmentation or a trip hazard. However, here we have a hose reel probably put in a long time ago. Maybe, maybe not. So what choices to make to extinguish a fire? An historical image here has got the open hose reel within a building. Now, these can often be found in old offices and warehouses and often in cupboards that have been forgotten. I don't like them, but that's just my personal choice and guidance. Next slide, please. Now we have a range of typical fire extinguishers. The first one is metallic, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But it is class A and for use on solid fuel fires, wood, paper, office, uh, typical uh, occupancy, um, stored materials, perhaps. Foam is for highly flammable liquids. And that's for class B fires. And dry powder uh, is for highly flammable gases. Uh, some people use them on electrical. I wouldn't advise that. There is no such thing as E for electrical, but I've put in the CO2 because typically that is used for electrical fires and they can come in small, medium, and large sizes, one kilo, two kilos, or five kilos. And then finally, the fire blanket, which is excellent if you've got a hot fat fire in a kitchen. There are also other extinguishers, foam, eco foam, wet chemical, we might come across those and halon systems such as BCF. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, this gives you a breakdown of pretty much of what I was saying, A, B, C, D, D for metal fires, and F for hot fat fires. And the slide after that, please, or before I leave you with that, uh, I'll say very quickly that this side says one minute's use for water, up to 30 seconds of CO2, maybe a bit longer if it's five kilos, but not much longer. Dry powder again, half a minute. Foam, half a minute. Now, fire blanket is forever. Uh, because you can leave it in place and provided that you're told to remove it by the brigade or the senior fire officer in charge. So fire blankets are very useful, but people need training to use them safely. Next slide, please. I talked about the Halon 1301BCF. And it's an odd extinguisher. You don't see them around now very much, but they are still to be had. An Inogen, excellent system uh, for reducing O2 levels, usually used in IT suites. Uh, but where we've got that sort of a system, the other uh, thing to remember is you need to get out. There's no good being at the back of the IT suite if the system is actuated. Otherwise, you will die. Next slide, please. Well, as an ex-pilot myself, I can recognize this picture, although I wasn't to blame, honest. Um, the BCF fire extinguisher that you see there in green is still the best to be carried within an aircraft for use if necessary. And you can compare it with the um, 
larger water extinguisher nearby and the even larger engine uh, in the background there. BCF for use on aircraft, ships and submarines still allowed, despite the, the fact that they're not permitted anymore for civilian use by the Montreal Protocol of 1987 because of their effect on the ozone layer. Next slide, please. Well, here you see a typical fire extinguisher installation. In this case, it's at a school and in the corridor. The extinguishers are stored in a cabinet. They're, they are water. We know that because we had a look when we took the photograph and carbon dioxide. And for some reason, somebody has left a dry powder extinguisher beside the box. And that might confuse people, because if you remember, I said earlier that dry powder is not advisable to use on electricals. It's certainly not advisable to use in confined space if you are going to remain in that confined space, because in inhalation is carcinogenic. And they are, in my experience, largely being fav favored of being phased out except under certain industrial applications, because water and CO2 uh, and foam uh, are uh, an acceptable alternative. There's a break glass on the, on the cabinet to prevent vandalism. And there are signs above the extinguishers on the wall above the extinguisher box. Deployment of extinguishers, actually putting them there in the first place, once more is determined, you know that, by now, by the fire risk assessment. Next slide, please. Well, here we have various options. Uh, we've got the floor stand for extinguishers, and that's very good because it's useful it tells you above that it's water or it tells you that it's carbon dioxide and it keeps them in place where they can be seen and they are accessible. Make sure that they are accessible and that nobody has parked something like a trolley or storage in front when you do your inspection. Offices where theft and vandalism is less likely, the conventional floor stands are an ideal solution. Far hose reels, on the other hand, can be very expensive to install. And the one in the middle is an excellent example of a new far hose reel that gives me confidence that that's going to be working if you need it. But they're often found in cupboards and in common parts of corridors or landings. They do have now, and you can see that in the picture on the right, automatic valves that function when the hose is unreal. And they're for outside use, hose reels are protected by weather resistant box. And that's the one in the middle there. Now in high rise buildings, I have to say firefighters carry their hands, um, the hose reels that they need, and they connect them to a dry riser inlet. That's because it's dry because it doesn't have water in it. And then they connect the bottom end, usually at ground floor level, not necessarily, to the brigade pump and then to a water hydrant. And then they pump and fill the dry riser to the required height. Now they connect the fighting hose within the building to those hose outlets on upper floors. If the building is higher than 18 meters or more, Pipe work is usually left filled with water, and that then is known as a wet riser. That's much quicker to operate. It has problems of its own. It needs inspecting and it needs to be tested. Both systems need to be tested annually anyway, so that their pressure is affirmed. Uh, but wet risers often save time because you don't need to fill the dry riser. Please maybe have the next slide. We've got a wet chemical extinguisher. I've seen a lot of these. They're excellent in kitchens uh, where you have got hot fat fires cooking chips. 
There's nothing to stop staff in an industrial environment from going to Sainsbury's, other retail outlets are available, and buying themselves a saucepan and a liter of oil and a bag of chips and cooking their own chips. And I frown upon that when I see it, uh, and I note it in the fire risk assessment because it is a management issue, but wet chemicals are excellent at doing the job for a hot fat fire. But chef needs to be trained and chef's replacement when chef is on leave needs to know how to use them. In larger kitchens where you've got extensive cooking, then other fixed fire extinguisher systems may be installed. It's by brand and Ansel comes to mind. It's a little bit like Hoover, it's a brand name. Fire blankets still have an important role, as I said earlier, in firefighting in smaller kitchens, particularly at home or at work. When you're doing a fire risk assessment at work, look out for hot plates. They're the culprits for fires if you're not careful. Next slide, please. Okay, here we've got some uh, confusing colors and confusing materials. The six litre foam extinguisher, it's got cream colored identification band. The contents may be described as A triple F. You may have heard that expression. It stands for aqueous film forming foam, and it's designed to exclude oxygen. The green colored label here indicates that this extinguisher medium has green credentials and is eco-friendly, which is admirable. Uh, occasionally you'll come across chrome or stainless steel bodied fire extinguishers. They're particularly popular in smart city offices. I don't have a problem if they're not within sight of other red bodied extinguishers, otherwise it becomes confusing. But if you're looking at a reception area with just silver or steel extinguishers, then that is permissible. But having said that, in general, it's a bad idea. You train people to remember the classical extinguisher colors, stick to the familiar colors and design consistency. Next slide, please. Now here we've got a, a sprinkler system. It's actually powered by a small diesel engine and the fire water is pumped to feed sprinklers directly or to fill a header tank. The system can be pressurized manually or automatically in the event of a fire alarm. And the sprinkler heads are actuated by heat at different temperatures. More of that later. Note that fire standards often change. Fire precaution principles and practices are updated all the time. So check with your fire safety advisor if in any doubt. Next slide, please. Now stopping fire spread, this is a very busy picture, but it shows a high rise office. I've done offices, I've done offices, it sounds as if I'm a petty crook. I'm, I have carried out fire risk assessments, I should add, uh, in the city of London on Canary Wharf um, at Tower 42, which confusingly has 44 floors and not 42. But this picture really is there to talk about passive fire protection. And you see that mostly in these large high rise buildings. And they are there to protect the structure of the building from a fire and to allow safe evacuation of the occupants and to protect the contents of a building and also to prevent or avoid at least the collapse of a building. They're put in to avoid the spread of smoke and toxic gases from passing through the building or into evacuation routes. Now, people are more commonly harmed by smoke and toxic gases in the event of a fire and not by burns or by flame. The more complex the building, the less mobile the occupants, the more important it is to limit the spread of smoke through the building. 
as the fire strategy, which is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, will commonly anticipate that the occupants will be protected for certain periods of time from the effects of fire. It's also to protect property, both the building and its contents from the spread of fire. Next slide, please. I've got a few slides now about fire stopping. And this one is resulted in wall penetrations, which as the photography will show you, have been well secured and are filled. I don't often see that. I'm used to, and my colleagues are used to finding buildings, rooms where IT often have put in new cabling and haven't secured the, the wall or the ceiling with adequate stopping or even the floor for that matter. So these are excellent illustrations of PFP, passive fire protection by fire stopping, and they happen to be in plant room walls to account for wall penetrations of electrical cabling or gas within circulation pipework for heating in this example. Next slide, please. Here we've got cables with fire stopping, a good standard of labeling and signing off. Can you see that there in that middle slide there? Check those dates when you go around. You want to see that, that that's a minimum of an annual um, as determined by the fire risk assessment, I, I hasten to add. And on the right hand side as well. So that, that's a good fire stopping. Next slide, please. And finally, yeah, it's still good. Um, it's smaller, uh, it's electrical, but they've still stopped it and it is uh, fire, passive fire protection. And we'll leave those slides uh, there, but where changes are done to cabling and pipe work, fire stopping may be perfor uh, perforated, perforated like new repairs. So they they need to be made good if you've cut through the compartmentation and the records must be updated and the accompanying certificate certification lead labels updated and take photographs because that's evidence of due diligence in a court of law. Next slide, please. Yep. OK, good. Fire doors now. What you're looking at is an FD60. It's a fire door. It's an FD60S. It's a fire door that gives one hour of protection against a fire. And the S means it has smoke protection as well, either by an intumescent strip or by bushy smoke seals on the door. I would say that the wall has to be twice the protection rating of the door. So in this case, where you've got an FD60, then the wall around it needs to be an, F, uh, an FP, a fire protection value of two hours or 120 minutes, if you like. And you can read for yourself what you have got on these doors. The CE mark is to be replaced. We'll tell you about that later if you're interested. And we have until the end of next year to get it right, because from January 23, the new UKCA mark needs to be on all new equipment that is installed. But don't worry about that. The installation and maintenance to these fire doors, I've put it down to 2008. I've actually changed that in my own notes. Um, they have been somewhat uh, updated now. Uh, 2017, I've got for installation, maintenance and sealing guidance. 
2017, sorry, and 2015, that was on BS8214, and 2015 for fire resistance and testing of doors and shutters. Okay, next slide, please. Now here we've got one that you see in residential areas in high rise blocks. This one doesn't have uh, a letterbox. Uh, if it did, the letterbox needs to conform to the same fire specifications as the door. It would make sense to do that. It makes no sense if it doesn't. And you can get fire protected letterboxes accordingly. They can offer you 30 minutes protection or 60 minutes to protection, depending on the door. In this case, the door is solid wood or more often composite fireboards. I didn't tell you with the FT60 door, but it's it was on the slide, 54 millimeters deep, fairly deep. The FT30 is 45 millimeters. So the way I rem remember it is turn them around. So 54, 60 minutes, 45, 30 minutes. That's how I remember it. Certificated softwood or hardwood frames and that's about all for the minute. It goes without saying that the glass above needs to offer a similar protection. Otherwise the fire will simply go above the door. Next slide, please. For doors, you need to have in some systems, not every system, a door closer. So the door stays open until the alarm sounds. This one is a sonic door closer. I remember it by calling it Sonic the Hedgehog. It's a door guard, that's a type of make. And when the alarm sounds, that latch will unlatch and the door will close, provided the fire return springs above the door are working and not hanging off the wall. The maglock, that's another make like Hoover and name another, Vacuum cleaner, don't do much vacuum cleaning these days. Dyson comes to mind. They're, they do the same job. In this case, it holds the door opened and it, again, it's linked magnetically into the fire alarm system. Next slide, please. This is very useful to you. So if those of you have got a camera on your smartphone, take a photograph of that, that gives you the necessary uh, background information on markings that you may find on far door furniture. Far door certification is a big issue and it includes the hardware and ironmongery, including the smoke seals, including the intumescent strips and the self closers or the hold openers as I call them. New slide, please. Well, we've got two photographs here which uh, illustrate a, a point in each case. Uh, the slide to the left, you will typically see this in buildings. I see it all the time. The far panel has become the home for the far logbook. The far logbook should and could be kept in a more secure place i.e. a box which is accessible but locked on the wall next to the fire panel so that it is protected and it can show your maintenance records and not be adulterated or lost. The picture to the right uh, is a fireman's lift. I'm sure they've got another name but I always call them fireman's lift. And the symbols on this lift may be confusing. The upper symbol, could you point to that, please? Point a person. Thank you very much. It's a very good symbol there. It tells you what you need to know without any words. The upper symbols uh, suggest that this farmer's lift is for evacuation of the premises. And the lower symbol, on the other hand, thank you very much, which is stuck 
where it is stuck and is confusing, therefore, suggests that one should not use the lift in the event of a fire. Generally, I say this in a broad brush stroke, firemen's lifts are there for evacuation of persons who have mobility issues. They're there for the brigade, but the brigade aren't going to arrive for the first three minutes of the alarm. And it may be in high rise offices that you have a workable system with areas that are refuges where a wheelchair user may be left provided there's a telephone for him or her to speak to the control center and ideally with a camera and for the lift to arrive with somebody to evacuate them to safety. It needs to be practice, it needs to be written into the fire evacuation system and the emergency response. The lift will stop at intermediate floors if necessary, but it is generally, as I say, for use of the fire brigade. Next slide, please. A girder box, once again, this is made by a company, unsurprisingly called Gerda, uh, and it's for the safe storage of fire information for the brigade. So if it's got a key, make sure the brigade have got a copy. They'll probably get into it, they'll use a hatchet, but you know, be friendly with your brigade and they'll help you as well. And Gerda boxes are a very good idea because they show that you've thought about it and they do give you access to the information where that clipboard of, uh, uh, of the fire logbook needs to be held and also drawings of the building and the fire emergency plan. All that sort of information can be held in a girder box. Next slide, please. We put in some information on fire alarm panels here, the ones that most typically you might see. The one on the left is called an analog system. And it usually got from one to eight zones maximum. And so it will tell the brigade provided that there, and also the person responsible for fire safety within the building might be security or somebody who will interrogate the alarm if there is a fire alarm sounding. Uh, you need a, a zone chart next to the analog fire panel to tell you where that is. It's showing you on a light, but you need to relate that to a picture. So it gives you a general idea as to which floor or which part of the building that the alarm is sounding. The one on the right, which is addressable, has got from eight to 60 addressable devices. That's why they're addressable. You don't address it, the device is addressable. And you can see there, it's got options for the lights to light up. And again, we'll tell you hopefully on a plan where that might be. It's very helpful if you've got a large building to know where your fire, fire is. It may also have a zone chart as well, which is why I put zones on there. And those standards uh, have been updated for Workplace 5839 part one is 2017 now. These are quite old slides, as you can see. And for domestic premises, um, since um, the, the, the Grenfell fire, uh, we've had the Fire Safety Act and uh, part six of the 5839 2019 applies. We can answer questions on that if you wish uh, at the Q&A stage. Next slide, please. Manual call points now, they do what they say on the tin. Some still have a break glass, so you can actually see that the glass is broken. Whereas this one sensibly has a plastic push uh, button uh, and they're tested using uh, the plastic device. I would like to see the fire alarm system tested uh, by the manual call point, uh, by ringing the alarm from a different numbered call point every week, so that each week you will test all of the individual manual call points. And by the end of a six months or a year, uh, when you typically have your servicing, perhaps quarterly if it's a large building, 
six monthly service and a full certification annually. That includes the manual call points and that detail goes into the file logbook. We should have a file action notice above every manual call point or to one side of it so that it will tell you what to do if you actuate the alarm and where the assembly point is. Next slide. Safe means of escape. Now, this is a wide door or doors in a school corridor. It, I happen to know that the stairs you can see in the background come down into that room behind those glass doors, the room with the tables, which is part of a cafeteria, uh, which um, is servicing staff to go and have a break and a coffee and sandwiches. Not a good idea, and there is an option if you look at that far right panel to run a separate corridor for occupants of upper stories coming down those stairs to get into the co corridor as a means of escape without having to pass through the cafeteria in order to do so. But the reason this uh, photograph was taken is to show you the picture of the chairs which are blocking the free access to or from that compartment, not a good idea. Next slide, please. Well, I didn't take this photograph, but I've seen too many of these examples. You've got here, far door, emergency exit only. How are you gonna get out? It's locked, it's padlocked. There's a steel bar blocking your way. It's showing that it's a far exit. It says push bar to open. I doubt that you'd get through there. It seems to me that the photograph's showing a chain between the right-hand side and the left-hand side. So you could push that bar and not get through. And on the, on the picture on the right, we see this all the time, a very useful floor plan of a meter, meter and a half wide uh, corridor delineated by the yellow marking. And what have you got at the end of it? You've got storage, within that means of escape, bringing it down to less than 800 millimeters, which is not allowed, and blocking the door, which is wrong. Next slide, please. Okay, to summarize, well, I'm not gonna read for you what you can read yourself, but I'll just say that it's about saving life and property. Good fire precautions rely on good management, on good management awareness and training and inspection, regular inspection, regular maintenance as required, both in the operator's instructions and the manufacturer's recommended instructions, backed up with good diligent processes and controls. Next slide. So what can we take away from this presentation? Well, it's true, fire is a fatal risk in all walks of life. It can, and it does kill. I haven't got any figures to substantiate how many in the UK that we have had with fatal consequences in the last year, for instance, doubt that we know, uh, but certainly we can provide data looking back several years and to give you some idea of what is working and what isn't working. Fire is fatal in all walks. Do not be complacent, it says. Absolutely. How many people sit at their desks even though they hear the alarm going? Don't be complacent. Never ignore warnings, which may be coming from the fire alarm system. It may be coming from one of the fire wardens. And yes, we will be making this uh, presentation available to you online through our IOSH Fire Risk Management Group IT system. So good housekeeping is vital. Learn the drill, find the means of escape, take care of your family, your friends and your colleagues and yourself. Do not forget yourself in that equation. 
I used to, for five years, I was the fire safety advisor for Thames Valley Police, and I managed to persuade the chief constable that police officers who swear an oath to protect life and property need to include their own lives and the safety of themselves in that equation. Okay, that is our final slide, apart from our next webinar in this series is on fire investigations and occurs on Thursday, the 13th of January, 2022 at 12.30. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, for a uh, what is a, I think, fairly extensive uh, description of uh, a fire precautions. Um, now, we don't have a lot of time left, unfortunately, for questions here this afternoon. Um, there are a large number, I think we have around about 60 old questions and things that's come in. Just a couple of questions, maybe to you and to, to Ian. Um, is there a minimum qualification or an accepted qualification for fire risk assessor? Shall I take that, Ian? Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the fire risk assessor has to be a competent person, and their competency is by various means of their training, their experience, their, their background, and uh, their ability to carry out a suitable and sufficient fire risk assessment. So it's horses for courses. If you're in a small property with few occupants, if there are less than five persons, then the employer doesn't need to record the fire risk assessment, but a risk assessment nevertheless has to be made. And with more than five people or five or more, then that has to be maintained in writing. So that competency will give that person the ability to do the job, either by shadowing somebody else as part of the experience and certainly by appropriate training. Do you have anything to add to that, Ian? No, I, I certainly agree with you there. Um, as I do with many things. This question has been asked before, uh, thoughtfully by people, and we have actually replied to it, certainly in webinar number two. So the, the frequently given answers to frequently asked questions for webinar two are, are now published. And in there, we include a table which gives um, a range of tasks, as you've just identified there, from simple jobs to much more complicated ones with levels of competence in terms of knowledge, approach, training and experience, which people should really have to, to undertake that particular aspect of the work. And certainly those who are members of IOSH and who follow the work of the Fire Risk Management Group will be certainly getting the background knowledge and, and experience and such like of this sort of thing to give them competency to undertake the assessment. Okay. Thank you for that, guys. Um, another very quick one. Um, should fire extinguishers be placed on appropriate stands or can they still be mounted on a wall? Oh, that's an easy one. Yes, they can be mounted on a wall and it's horses for courses. Mounting on the wall is good if you can because then they're higher from the ground and uh, easier to spot. And they're also easier to lift down rather than if you're aged like myself to lift up from the ground, but floor stands have a place as well. Yes, it's interesting also that with, in, in modern offices in particular these days, walls are not particularly strong. So you have to be particularly careful in the way in which it's secured to the wall. And so often the bracket will come off and people will therefore stand it on the, on the floor. Um, I noticed one of the questions asked, which we'll reply to in more detail, was how do you stop people switching extinguishers around in stands? Well, normally they have a sort of what's a, a pokey uh, solution. In other words, the diameter of the, the aperture where the water extinguisher stands is about the size of a, a water extinguisher, and the carbon dioxide one, of course, is smaller. So it does sort of make it easier that the water always goes on the left and the carbon dioxide dioxide on the right. Um, so people do do put some thought and knowledge and experience into designing fire precautions, which hopefully people will be trained in their use and be familiar with them and where they are in their place of work, 
but also it becomes intuitive. So if you have to, I wouldn't say run, walk quickly to somewhere, pick up an extinguisher and use it, you'll make the first choice and you'll make the right choice every time. Okay, and one final one, which I think is a fairly quick one, particularly as we're just coming up to our hour now, is regarding the new UKCA marking, does this mean all existing equipment needs to be replaced or evaluated, or is it just applicable to new equipment? I, um, I'll be delighted to reply to this in much more detail when, when time <laughs> allows, if I may uh, share. But the very short answer to this is um, there, is a, there is a system at the moment, an interregnum between two dates. And essentially one date was uh, Brexit day, which is the 31st of January, 2020. And the other date is the 31st of December, 2022. So at the moment we're in this interregnum, as it were, between the two, two different things. Uh, anything that was CE marked will have been compliant with product safety legislation at the time it was marked. There are changes to the regulations and the UKCA marking, which stands for United Kingdom Conformity Assessed Marking, will be applicable in future. So anything that you buy which is new, new fire safety equipment will be UKCA marked but you can continue at the moment with the existing equipment that you have. But we'll, uh, we'll specify and hopefully, uh, I think this is a very good topic area um, where, for example, fire risk management group, we could produce some guidance maybe on, on what the regulations say and what the legal position is and hopefully give some sort of um, suggestions to industry as to how, that, how people can comply with it. Because it's one of these awkward, awkward issues I'm afraid we have to deal with at the moment. <laughs> Indeed well thank you for that explanation Ian after all, it's nothing is straightforward I think in this. It isn't, no, sadly not. Exactly so excellent thank you for that. Um, it is now just after half past one UK time and therefore I do have to bring this um, seminar to uh, an end. I will say though that we do have as I say uh, oh, we now have 78 questions of 79 and they're still rising um, we will actually look at those questions and we will prepare a question and answer document, which will be then available to you um, in normally about two to three weeks. But please bear in mind that we do have a Christmas period, which might mean it get, might get slightly delayed further. Um, but we will try to get it out before the next webinar uh, in January. So it just falls to me actually to actually say um, a big thank you to Alan Shaw who's given us the presentation today. It was another really interesting session and clearly with the questions and things that's been raised, it sort of provoked a lot of thought and discussion amongst the people who have attended here today. I need to also thank um, Ian for joining for the question and answers. Michelle, who is hiding behind the scenes um, and working like mad and actually moving the slides on for Alan in this case as well. Um, their help is just so important to these webinars as we move on. And I mustn't also forget Ben, who works for IOSH, um, and he's behind the scenes looking after the technical side. So, once again, we hope that in whatever OSH role or, or fire role you have, we hope you found this webinar useful and informative to you as well. A reminder, once again, that the fourth webinar is scheduled for the, uh, the at 12.30 UK, on the 13th of January, when we'll be looking at the basics of fire investigation. And I'm sure you can see that that's gonna be a really interesting. And again, I'm sure discussion will be great actually as a result of that. And we certainly hope that you'll be able to join us um, for that session. And finally, may I thank you all for attending today. And also on behalf of the IOSH Fire Risk Management Group, can I wish you all the compliments of the upcoming season. Let's all hope that 2022 sees us all returning to a more normal world once again. So to you all, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>